I am very young and lack the skill required to portray the hell I endured during my trip. For that, I apologize. I considered writing this later when my writing skills have further developed. However, by that time, I would have forgotten much of the trip. I have read many other trip experiences and decided it's time to share my indescribable event with others. I would like to start this entry off by saying I was very young and immature. I still am. At the time, I was 15 years old and bored with my life. I had done salvia a couple of times and enjoyed it. When I heard a dealer would have DMT available, I was instantly interested. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. My dealer had DMT crystals available previously and I smoked a very small amount, around 10 to 15 milligrams possibly, and enjoyed it greatly. The trip was beautiful and I badly wanted to repeat it. The day had come when my dealer had MAOI available for consumption with DMT pills. I was with three friends. My dealer had provided for us each a pill. I was given an extra that he owed me. My pill was loaded with the most DMT, around 250 milligrams. My friends each had about 150 milligrams in theirs. We walked to a public park and each consumed an MAOI. Half an hour later, at 8.02, we took the pills. We all sat down, relaxed, chilled on the swings, and waited for the effect to kick in. None of us were feeling anything after about an hour and decided to contact our dealer. He advised to wait longer as it is tough for the body to digest. We returned to my house, smoked some hookah, and relaxed, waiting for the effects to kick in. About a half an hour passes and my sibling informs me that my father wants to have dinner with me. Yes, I'm a fucking idiot. Complete idiot. I chose the completely wrong setting for such an event to occur. I proceed inside and eat with my dad, guacamole and bread. Reality is buzzing, paranoia is taking over me, and my complete surroundings are vibrating. My father does not notice that I am acting very strange. The room was shaking. At this point, I am able to control myself, but struggle doing so. Finally, I finished eating and returned to my friends in the garage, finding one of them laying on the stairs. I am informed he collapsed. He is able to communicate with me and I tell him to sit up. I am completely unaware of the power of DMT and presume to assume he is having a little trouble. The DMT is hitting me harder and harder. Every step I took felt like taking a step on a step on a different height. This is too much. My dealer provided for us kill pills, some sort of white substance. I had no idea what was in them, but we were told they would kill our trip within 5 minutes or less. I pulled the pills out of my pocket. I have two, another 250 milligram DMT pill and a kill pill. I am tripping so hard that I mix up the pills. My friends take the proper kill pills. I took another DMT pill, accidentally, and drank a half a can of an energy drink. Another mistake. I took a step outside the garage, leaving my friends on the staircase to an upstairs apartment. Colors are swerving. Immediately, the DMT takes me completely. The tree began to breathe. The leaves had eyes. I look at the grass and am immediately submerged between each petal. I looked up towards the sky and a checkerboard took over. The checkerboard had small squares, those of blue and a pinkish purple. The checkerboard was in a kaleidoscope effect and constantly spiraling. I can barely control myself and walk further away from the house onto a field that is a part of our property. We have a hill under a fig tree where I choose to lay down as walking was way too much. Paranoia was destroying me. The effects immediately changed. I was a camera in the corner of a room, a completely white room with black lines for the outlines of the walls. I was watching an alien family communicating in a language that was completely gibberish. Their voices were extremely high pitched and every word they said was unrecognizable. I believed I was in this stage for the longest time. Colors were swerving, the whiteness turned into the checkerboard again. The checkerboard, however, was much darker, black and purple, very much darker. There was no more sky, I was floating inside the kaleidoscope, falling and falling. 
There was no end to the falling. My body was doing all sorts of flips. At this point, I had lost all control and forgotten about reality. Every word I had thought in my mind would be repeated over and over. I questioned my ego. Every word I thought to myself was changing pitch as the thought was being processed in my mind. As I created each statement in my consciousness, my mind reprocessed it, questioning whether if it was legitimate or not. After each statement was produced in my head, visual subtitles were produced to follow. The subtitles were flying in front of my eyes, going up and down, twisting, vertically, horizontally in numerous ways. The subtitles were also being bent, adapting to the pitch change of my voice. This is all in a layer between the black and purple never-ending kaleidoscope. The kaleidoscope was a new dimension that my body was constantly floating in. I was thinking to myself, what the fuck is this? Put your palm to your mouth and produce a constant sound. Muffle that sound by flapping your palm forward and away from your mouth. I've always thought that's what Native Americans did or something. Anyways, that's exactly what was going through my head. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. The on and off cutoff of my speech was also being altered by the change of pitch. I kept asking myself, what is this? What the fuck? What's happened to me? What is my name? Who am I? The change of pitch only terrified me more. I completely lost grasp of reality and myself in an unknown dimension. All my senses had blended together. My perception was fucked inside out. I spoke faster and faster to myself, yelling, cursing my brother. I screamed at the top of my lungs like a girl as loud as I could. I wanted to get out. I wanted out of this hell. This part is extremely hard to describe. During this part, I had felt like everything before this experience was constantly seeking for answers, seeking for a quest, seeking for a reason for life, a purpose of life. At the time of the trip, this was the climax. I felt as if I had been blinded from the truth my whole life, and now this was it. The truth. This is reality. Everything before this was just a dream. I panicked. This is it. I am in hell. This is what my parents are always telling me about. An unrecognizable pain arises from the back of my throat. The back of my mouth was being pried open. A cone, ten times the size of my throat opening, was being forced out of my throat to the forward of my mouth. I began vomiting. I didn't know I was throwing up. This was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life and never want to go through anything like it ever again. The throw up didn't end. I thought to myself it was acid and tried to stay away from it, yet it would not stop coming out of my mouth. I felt as if my whole body exploded. My insides were bursting out of me. I would lost complete identification of my body parts and simply felt as if I was falling apart. The acid was a green brown color and came out of me like large diarrhea. I screamed and screamed and did not stop screaming. There was no other way out. I wanted to make noise. I wanted out of this hell. The throwing up cools down and I am yet again lost in this unknown dimension. I hear voices around me. Did he take drug? Oh no, he's doing drugs. This next part I can describe vividly. It felt like a lucid dream. In this dream, I was collapsed on the ground. A reality was formed. A stable environment was around me. The environment was nothing like our everyday environment, but it was stable. The sky was blue, trees were green, however, it was all like a painted picture. A picture a five-year-old had painted, with water pencils. Nothing was sharp, everything had round edges to it. I was on the ground collapsed, laying there. I was surrounded by people. Everyone was asking, did he take drugs? My mind processed this statement and absorbed the word drug. The word drug changed meaning. The word went under numerous changes in pitch and length. The word was stretched out. In this dimension, the word had marked my death sentence. The term drug described one who was about to die, who had been marked by the horrible disease. Drug was a disease and I had caught it. I was in this state on the ground for in reality was about a half an hour. I had lost all track of time. 
Finally, shapes were returning to their original form. Reality was coming back. A layer between my perception and my real environment was created. Shapes were put between these layers. The trip was dying down. I ran into a fence head on as I was being chased and stabilized by my family. I kept fighting as they were all holding on to me, keeping me from hitting more objects. I collapsed onto the cement driveway and was dragged into the grass. I laid in the grass. Spiraling back from the unknown dimension was like riding a never-ending spiraling slide, and throughout that was the horrifying checkerboard of black and purple. The slide ended with a powerful thump, and I was back. Faces were staring at me. This return to reality was like being born. There was blood on my shirt. I was in complete confusion, and faces were staring at me. I saw our house and the car for the first time. Slowly, things were coming back to me. I felt as if I was seeing everything for the first time. The last thing I remember hearing in the unknown dimension was my brother's voice. He said my name and asked me if I was okay. Hearing his recognizable voice was like seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I was in instant relief. That was the trip. A bad fucking trip. An overdose of 500 milligrams. The intended amount was 250 milligrams, which I thought was supposed to last for an hour or two. My friends were alright, they were dropped off. I do not know exactly what they experienced, but my brother told me they were wanting hugs from him. I am happy what happened to me did not happen to them. My neighbor heard me screaming and called a neighborhood security guard who came and assisted my family in wrestling me to the ground. He asked me what I had taken and I yelled in his face, Dimethyltryptamine! The security guard called the police, who were really friendly, and flashed their flashlight in my eyes and took me up inside my house and laid me on the bed and left. This was all after the trip ended. I laid on the bed for what seemed like a half an hour until everyone had left. After I regained stability, I was helped inside the house, to my room. Halfway there, I collapsed onto the tile of my living room. My vision was completely blurred by skinny orange lines. I continued my voyage up the stairs and into my room. I was in so much pain. I took a shower and slept. In my sleep, there was no dream. I shut my eyes and was in a realm of black, pure black, everywhere. I woke up the next day with loose braces, a black eye, and bites all over my body. My palms were covered with ant bites. Texas fire ants had eaten me. I could not type due to the fire ants. My hands were completely swollen. I had ant bites between my fingers. I had ant bites on top of other ant bites. Apparently after I was throwing up and running around the yard, I rolled around in ant piles. This is most likely what caused the unbearable pain and hell. I believe the energy drink and food I had eaten before caused the never ending throw up. This was a life-changing experience and all happened two days before my 15th birthday. You are all probably thinking I'm a fucking idiot and you are 100% correct. I messed up big time. I hope what I have written is beneficial to you. Once again, I apologize for my lack of description. I have read numerous other posts on this website and found them all very descriptive and written professionally. I fear by that time I will have forgotten my experience. I am an idiot, and I have definitely learned from my mistake. DMT is an extremely powerful substance, and I now respect it for its capabilities. Such a substance should be used wisely. I will not be tampering with psychedelics until I am older and my brain somewhat returns to its original state of being. Since this experience, my brain has been a mess. My life has changed. In the unknown dimension before the pain, I met with my ego. I met with my inner soul trapped within my body and questioned its purpose and being. I feel like I must return to this realm in the future again. I am happy to learn from my mistakes. I learned a lot from this experience. A lot. Please, be careful. Hello, I'd like to start off this report by saying I live in the Middle East, so excuse any grammar mistakes if there are any. As you might know, there is an ongoing conflict here. 
for privacy reasons and to not rile up any controversy and criticism. I will not disclose my location, my side of the conflict, and will not include any needless politics with hopes this report will be read for what it's meant to be, a warning. I will only note that I am a civilian and I am not involved in fighting. I have a very low tolerance for weed, even though I am a daily smoker. I can get astronomically high from a single bowl. The first night I smoked one bowl of weed mixed with tobacco after midnight. I also took 10 mg pseudoephedrine as a nose and ears decongestant a few hours prior, as I am currently sick. For those who are unaware, pseudoephedrine has a very similar chemical structure to methamphetamine and could be psychoactive and addictive. Long ago, I did the exact same thing and experienced hallucinations and a stronger high than usual, but the overall feeling was great. Stupidly, I thought to myself that it's going to be the same and that I could let my mind drift off from the current events in my region. Boy, was I wrong. Usually after a bowl, I sit down by my PC and watch videos or movies or listen to music to aid with the drifting away effect I always desire. This time though, confusion and panic hit almost instantly after the bowl and I went to bed to try and relax. I kept my room dimly lit and closed all doors and windows as to avoid any sounds that might scare me and send me into distress. That attempt was to no avail unfortunately. I live near a hospital and as I mentioned before, there's a conflict where I live. Because of that, helicopters kept flying over my house, bringing in more and more wounded people. This is where the scary part starts. I laid on my pillow and put on my headphones to cancel out the noise, but that didn't help. Through the sounds of the aircraft, I heard auditory hallucinations of people speaking, news anchors reporting of a great amount of deaths, screams of horror, rapid ringing noises going up and down in pitch, and random vibrations with no discernible pattern. I started seeing pitch black figures in the corner of my eyes. Sometimes they were of people covered in blood, sometimes of people aiming guns at me. Their faces were distorted, having a devilish appearance. I felt my bed rocking back and forth as I also heard knocking on my doors and windows. I could swear my heart rate was approaching above 200 beats per minute and I thought I was losing my mind. During this time, I was not afraid that I was dying, rather I wished I was dead. I was twitching and moving around my room uncontrollably as I sensed my survival instincts kicking in. I felt like a feral animal in a cage trying to find an escape. This hell continued for what seemed like hours, even though after checking it was only 20 minutes. All of this time, my phone exploded with reports of the ongoing fighting and imagery of war fields, bodies burning, and people running for their lives. This filled my mind which increased my stress level by a thousandfold. Sharp pains started appearing all over my body as I imagined being violently stabbed and shot. Also, I feared for some moments that people have infiltrated my house with intentions to kill my family. I wanted to check on them, but feared for my life. This fear caused sharp pain in my head, and black spikes pulsating with red outlines started appearing in my peripheral vision. I felt so hopeless and so weak. I couldn't contact any family members in my home for relief, as I feared they could see I'm high. They are critical of my smoking habits and my eyes were completely bloodshot. My pupils were so big I couldn't make out my iris in the mirror. Thankfully, I found a friend who was awake and immediately called him. When he answered, words didn't come out of my mouth. I only mumbled and sobbed incoherently. Keep in mind the ringing noises were still loud and clear in my head and I can barely hear my friend's attempts at calming me down. After what seemed again like hours, I finally calmed down a bit, told my friend goodnight, and tried to sleep what just happened off. For the following days, I could still hear knocking noises and what seemed like shooting sounds from afar. I could still see figures in my peripheral vision. Unfortunately, this story doesn't end here. Yesterday, I felt more calm, more optimistic about life, and felt hope that this will all end soon. Therefore, I decided to smoke weed again for some stupid reason. Keep in mind, I was still taking pseudoephedrine. This time, the high started off way more calmly with a positive tone. I decided to watch a funny movie to cheer myself up and keep my mind off of its worries. 
I began feeling lightheaded in a good way, slowly drifting away into my own world. Then I had to get up to use the toilet, but when I came back and sat on my chair, I immediately regretted smoking. The sharp pain I felt days prior came back with an intensity I can't describe, mainly focused on my limbs for some reason. There was a feeling of me being sucked into some singularity in the center of my abdomen. My head was crowded with thoughts of anxiety, anguish, and death. A horrifying sensation I felt is that I could hear a very deep voice man saying, Zzzz, shh, shh, in my head. Each time I heard those noises, the sharp pains became stronger, and I could feel that my body sensation was offset more and more from where my body was actually located. I could feel my arm touching the wall, even though I was in my chair meters away. I felt my back touching the cold floor, even though I was fully clothed and on my chair. This entire time I forced my eyes shut, as when I opened them, everything had a dark red hue, which only deepened my visceral fear. This time, all of these sensations were way more intense. Concerns for my physical health were also prevalent this time. My heart rate was easily audible in my ears, and I measured it to be 240 beats per minute at some moments. It was at least 120 beats per minute consistently for two hours. I feared for my life, either feeling I could be brutally killed or have a heart attack. I managed to calm down after three hours from initially smoking, this time completely on my own as no friends were available and family was definitely out of the question as I mentioned before. In conclusion, I could certainly say that in these two instances, I felt panic and fear like never before in my life. I would not wish this upon my worst enemy. I still have lasting effects, hearing ringing noises and seeing things that aren't there. I really hope that these are only temporary residual effects that won't last as a permanent memory of my foolish decisions, but only time will tell. The message I want to convey from this story is that when you have anxiety from ongoing events, you should think twice before indulging in mind-altering substances. I can't imagine what I could have went through if I took a psychedelic. Always try to confide in family and friends before doing something which you might regret for the rest of your life. I fear that I might smoke again soon and experience the same horrors, as weed is a coping mechanism for me, and it is also a substance that I rely on for pain management and have some dependence on. My deep condolences go out to anyone affected by the ongoing conflict in my region and any other current deadly world events. Please keep yourself protected and use safe and healthy measures to help with stress. Peace. When I was 13, I was very interested in finding ways to get high. I had no care in the world, and maybe I didn't really care about myself. All I cared about was getting high and whatever I can get my hands on. One afternoon I searched ways to get high at home, and one of the very first things that popped up was Air Duster. Knowing that I could easily get a hold of it, I asked my dad to buy me some for my PC. He brought me a four pack. I was excited and couldn't wait. I took a hit and for two seconds I thought to myself, this is bullshit, then it kicked in. This innocent looking can of duster suddenly became my best friend and my portal to a surreal world. I kept hitting it, I wanted to get higher and higher and just couldn't stop. I began to hear a thumping sound, almost like a giant phoenix flapping its wings above my house, and with each huff it got faster and louder. My vision became a kaleidoscope of swirling colors. I loved it, and I don't know why. I would continue huffing every day for the next week, and when I was halfway through my last can, I realized I had a problem. I decided to put it in the garbage. I knew it would be best for me. And yet, an hour later, I was back digging in the garbage for it. I found it and began to huff. This is the moment when the addiction won. I finished that final can and began to have cravings. So I asked my dad to take me grocery shopping, but I didn't care about the groceries. I only wanted the duster. 
I'd wander away from my dad and walk to the electronics section. I would act casual and slip a couple of cans into my hoodie without anyone noticing. It was like a secret mission every time, heart racing, hands shaking, hoping I wouldn't get caught. And this became a routine, a messed up routine. I talked my dad into taking me grocery shopping more often than necessary, just so I could steal some duster and keep the high going. One morning, I decided to huff in the shower. I took the biggest hit I could and blacked out. My mom and brother heard the fall and quickly ran in and witnessed me on the shower floor, seizing with my eyes rolled back into my head and my mouth drooling. When I came to consciousness, I saw utter fear in my mother's eyes. My mom freaked out and took the can. Despite the fact that I almost died, I continued to huff every day. I would get caught a few more times over the course of a few weeks, but eventually, I got sneaky and I was able to go undetected for a couple of months. After two months without getting caught, I came home from school and my mom told me she cleaned my room and found my stash. 44 empty cans and two full cans found in a luggage bag under my bed, each one a testament to my addiction. I had been addicted and I didn't even realize. The addiction consumed me. She started sending me to a drug treatment program, but I didn't care to stop at any cost. I started huffing at school. I would skip class and I'd huff in the bathroom stalls. I would huff anywhere I could. Eventually, I was able to take bigger hits and trip even harder. Among the hallucinations, a few stood out. A pixelated image on my wall that I would see every single time. And then there was a 90s R&B song. I don't know the name of it. I don't even know if the song exists. Yet it played on loop as if it were the soundtrack of my mind. But amidst these surreal experiences, there was one hallucination that resonated profoundly. I found myself viewing fragments of my life through the eyes of my mom. I felt her emotions, her fears, and her love. In those moments, I felt the pain and fear I was causing her. Despite me knowing my addiction was hurting those around me, the darkness of addiction gripped me tighter. The most horrific experience was when I blacked out. However, when I woke up, I wasn't in my room. I found myself suspended between the realms of consciousness and oblivion. Reality had become a shifting mirage. I existed in a state of paradox where the boundaries between self and the universe blurred into obscurity. I was simultaneously nothing, yet at the same time, I was everything. I was God. I saw colors unknown to man in endless fractal patterns, and yet I saw nothing. Time lost its meaning. I was untethered from this reality completely. I was free from the constraints of time. In that paradoxical state, I experienced a profound existential crisis. Questions about the nature of reality, the purpose of existence, and the meaning of my own life. Was this a glimpse into the fundamental truths of reality, or was it merely a product of my chemically altered mind? That night, I became aware of the fragile nature of human perception. The mind was capable of transcendent experience and yet vulnerable to distortion. My journey through this surreal landscape left me with a deep sense of dread and inspiration. I recognized the delicate balance between the tangible world we perceive and the infinite unknown that lies beyond our comprehension. The experience, though unsettling, became a catalyst for personal growth, inspiring me to explore the depths of my own consciousness. It felt like an eternity had passed, yet when I woke back into this reality, only five minutes had gone by. I don't know how huffing caused me to have psychedelic experiences that has always been a mystery to me. If anyone else has experienced something similar, please let me know. I quit huffing cold turkey. One day I took a hit and something changed. I don't know what changed, but from that hit, my addiction just ended. Huffing isn't getting high. It's your brain's panic response to your brain cells dying. Huffing can cause irreversible brain damage and even death. 
I was recently professionally IQ tested and got a score of 121, and although that is higher than average, I sometimes wonder what my results would have been if I never huffed. What potential did that demon take away from me? If you're a teen desperate to get high, please do anything but huffing. I am now 15 and every time I think about those moments, I get a sense of PTSD. So one night around May 2019, I was just chilling in my bed, didn't have anything to do the next day. I was in alternative school and only went to school three days a week. One of my friends hit me up and asked if I wanted to go over to someone named Daniel's house. Keep in mind, Daniel's parents were out of town for the night. I have never met Daniel before, but Sam said him, his girl, and another dude were over there getting high and chilling, but Daniel and the other people, we will call them Sam and Wilson, they both drank 800 milligrams of DXM and took 35, 25 milligram Benadryls. This was a crazy shock for me because I had taken Benadryl once and only took 15 and it was scary, but he said we weren't gonna do any. This would turn out to be false in the future. So I said fuck it and went over to Daniel's house, which I had to walk four miles to get there, so keep that in mind. I meet with Sam and his girlfriend at some apartments behind Daniel's house and we get there. I sneak through the window and when I walk down the hall, the first thing I see is Wilson sitting against the front door with his face in his hands. I was like, okay, I didn't know him so I just walked away. But Daniel was in his room bugging out on his bed. He couldn't make coherent sentences and was just blabbering so I go back to the living room and me, Sam, and his girl spark up a few joints and as time passes, Wilson starts to roam around the house, not making any sense but still trying to complete some sort of tasks in his delirium world. I guess Wilson was the type of guy who didn't care what happened to him when he tripped. Sam showed me texts from Wilson from the previous night they had planned it. That Wilson wanted us to mess with him while he was tripping cause it would make the night crazier or something. Anyways, me, Sam, and his girl were teasing Wyatt around and he was chill. It was funny like asking where the fridge went when it was right in front of him or looking for something that's not there. It was all shits and giggles until later in the night around 3am. Sam convinced me to take 17 Benadryls with him, which I was really skeptical because I'd snuck out so I had to be home early, but he said he would Uber me home and everything would be fine, so I agreed. I took all 17 and Sam lays out his 17, but we go in Daniel's room for a second and when we come out, the Benadryl is gone and Wilson is sitting on the bar stool next to the counter where the Benadryl was with his head down and we call his name. When he looks up, his face is pale. He didn't look good. We knew he had taken them, but we couldn't get a direct answer from him because he was just blabbering nonsense. This would set Wilson at a total of 52 Benadryl. We laid him down, got some water, and he started to chill. But my trip was kicking in, and I started to feel really weird. Sam promised we could smoke up together and have some grub on his little couch in the living room, but when the time came, he didn't let me on and sat up there with his girlfriend and left me to lay on the floor. I wasn't going to argue, he was two years older than me and bigger, and I didn't want to kill the vibe so I let it be. I laid on the floor and my trip got intense. I saw what looked to be a rainbow circus of hundreds of dancing ants and spiders, but they were almost holographic, wicked shit. Then we all go into Daniel's room to mess around with him a bit, then I sort of blacked out. I kinda zone in and I'm standing in Daniel's room on my phone just swiping around the home screen, and the little banner when someone calls you on iPhone pops up, and it's my dad. Fuck, I gotta get home. I go to answer, but he hangs up immediately. Did he find out I was gone and changed his mind and wants to wait for me to get home to talk to me? I immediately ran to the living room, grabbed all my weed stuff and shoved it in my pockets. I said bye and dipped, but I was never on my phone. I never had my phone. That whole time I was hallucinating. Now as soon as I got out the window, I blacked out. The way I was supposed to go back to my house was right, but I went left. 
my memory fades back to me somewhere at the front of a neighborhood with a sign and some bushes. Oh cool, this is by my neighborhood. I have to put my weed here because my dad might search me, is what I said to myself. I leave the weed in those bushes and I black out again. My memory fades back to me walking in a big long dark field. I just want to say this first. I don't have my AirPods, vape, or phone from here on out. My memory fades back. I'm walking and I see my AirPods go flying out of my pocket. So I walk back a few steps and bend down and it was almost like there was a light shining on the grass. I could see it so clear. When I go to grab my AirPods, they start sinking into the grass. In a panic, I start ripping up the grass trying to get them, but I couldn't. Oh, I'll just go get some new ones, I thought. I keep walking, same thing. I see my phone fly to my pocket this time though. I reach down to grab it, it starts sinking. Oh, I'll just go get a new one, I thought again. Then my vape goes flying. The same thing repeated at least 30 times, but I never questioned it once. I black out again. Now I'm in a truck. I look around. The interior looks like my friend Lance's truck. Huh, this is weird. He must be picking me up from school to smoke or something. I look to my left, and there's a Hispanic man and woman who seem to be partners, and they open the door and start asking me if I'm okay, if I have a family, do I need food and water, etc. I look around and notice something is off, and I see a random house and tell them I'm waiting on my friend to get something out of that house. They say okay and I shut the door and get on my imaginary phone and start swiping again. Then I black out once again. I wake up in the passenger seat, but I'm on a street next to a roundabout, and almost as soon as I look up, a cop car comes flying around the corner and parks in front of the truck. I look over to the driver's seat. I don't see anyone in there, but I'm still tapping on the headrest yelling, Lance, Lance, the cops are here. The cop comes around to my side and opens the door and throws me out of the car and to the ground and handcuffs me. He starts asking me if I took anything from this man's truck. Why am I in the truck? I say, no, why would I ever steal anything from my friends? I look up and I swear to God, I see Lance and his ex-girlfriend doing dabs in his truck out of his rig. I was so confused how the cops didn't arrest him, but they arrested me. Marijuana is illegal in my state. The cop rudely asked me why I wasn't in school and I said, because I don't got school today, dumb fuck, which he pointed his finger at my face and got a little angry, but he walked away. An ambulance pulls up and they sat me in the stretcher, still handcuffed. They then ask if I know a Wilson or Daniel. I say no, but now I am shitting bricks, still high as balls. Some paramedic woman who couldn't be older than 22 locks the ambulance up and starts questioning me. She asked what year it is. I thought she asked what ear it is, and at that time I was missing my left AirPod, so I pointed to my left ear. I don't know how that thought process came to mind, but she re-asked the question. I say 2019. She asked about the president, then my age, and I nailed them. But then she asked the fateful question, what did you take? I said nothing, then she gives me a look, and I ask, will you tell my parents? She said no. I said I took acid and I went on a walk and got lost. She asked, are you scared? I said no and she left the ambulance, but then joked around with six other officers about my answer to that question. They sit me in the back of the police car and I didn't have an ID so they start asking me my information, but I refused thinking I would be let free. Turns out it doesn't work like that and they took me down to the police station in which the ride felt like forever. But as soon as we pulled in that little garage area, I blurted out my information and said, tell my dad to come get me right now. So my dad arrives and he is pissed. He said I looked like I hadn't slept in three days and my eyes were wide as a bat. He lectures me the whole way home, but I only got grounded for two days. But Wilson and Daniel did not have the same outcome. They both try to get on the school bus in the morning, but Daniel was shoeless, sockless, shirtless, and looked like a total zombie when he got on the bus. But Wilson, also shirtless, was stuck with his hand on a mailbox swaying back and forth. 
there was a video of this and another video of Wilson running away from the bus scared. They weren't allowed to hang around each other again and both got grounded for several months. Moral of the story, don't do DPH. My brain is still fried four years later. For the people who don't know or never did Duster, let me tell you that you have a chance to literally die every huff you take. The gas cuts the air to your brain. Every time you huff, you don't know what to expect. Maybe you'll just hear ringing and see blurry, or you can hallucinate and have crazy sensations you never felt before and could be hardly described. I am 18, I did a lot of ADHD medications, benzos, opiates, tried ecstasy and mushrooms a couple of times, drank a shit ton of hard liquor and beers, smoke a shit ton of weed as well, and I've done air duster and gasoline a few times. Every time I do duster with my homie, we go through the entire can. When I huff this shit, I always say to myself, okay, last huff. I don't know why, but I can't get myself to do a last one. The high is just too fucking great. I can't stop until the can is empty. I was with two of my friends at my dad's house, and it was the 18th birthday of one of them. Before he came home, I bought a bottle of dust off at the dollar store. My other friend who was with me never tried duster, so I went to my room and grabbed two balloons to show him how it's done. It doesn't take much gas in a balloon to get high as fuck, as long as you keep breathing in and out until you're too fucked up to keep doing it. My homie fucking loved it, even for a guy who does a lot of drugs. He's doing coke daily, did a lot of crack, speed, meth, and Adderall in the past. He said that this shit wasn't like anything he's ever tried. The duster high is very strange, you can't compare the high with anything. Maybe gasoline, but not exactly. Duster is far more intense. You hear ringing, your vision is blurred. You can literally feel yourself like there's three of you. Everything is in slow motion and you laugh like a mental patient. Every time you huff, you have the same buzz. There's no tolerance to this shit. Only thing you can do is huff a bigger balloon than the last one you did to get twice as fucked up. It's fucking dangerous. Each time I do duster, there's a point where I don't give a fuck anymore. My friend came and he joined our huff sesh. Maybe 10 minutes after he joined, we were fucked, laughing crazy and tripping listening to music. That day I kept hitting the bottle like a vape. I do not know how much time went by. I know that the can was three quarters full when my second homie came in. I kept huffing the can even when I was still tripping until the can was empty. I was high as fuck for a straight 20 minutes at least. I knew this was bad, but man, this high is not like any other drugs. Even when the can was done, my high wasn't. I was high for another 45 minutes. I was dizzy, had trouble breathing, and was close to nodding out from the lack of oxygen. You can't breathe right when you huff duster. The high is basically lacking oxygen in the head. I really thought I was gonna die. I have asthma and having trouble breathing because of a can is even worse. I was scared to be stuck with this high. Only thing I could do is sit in front of the house taking some deep breaths and drinking water because I hate puking. My liver or kidney was hurting like hell. I don't know why, but I said to myself that if I didn't die from this shit that day, I'll never do it again. Each time you do duster, for me, I always got this headache and dizziness until I go to sleep. I am scared of brain damage and being fucked forever for a cheap buzz. Please don't do air duster. The high is awesome, but remember, you can fucking die every time you take a hit, even if you do it for the first time. Edit. I just did duster this afternoon. Oh man, let me tell you what happened. This was really intense. I huffed four to five big hits and I could feel my head and my body two different ways, like they were both slowly spinning. My body felt warm, shaky, and really fucked up like I could feel my soul in my body and my head was ringing like crazy. I remember being on the ground just laughing and thinking about this subreddit, like how could I describe it, how fucked up it was. 
Then, a few times after, I did a huge fucking balloon, and I was watching Trailer Park Boys, and every sentence I was listening to was in triple. On top of that, the ringing in my ears was even worse. My whole vision was shaking and blurry. My body felt like it was in slow motion with the blurred outline when I tried to move my hand. It felt fucked, but at this moment, I was just laughing and thinking to myself that Duster is literally heroin or something. My homie nodded out and was in his head, doing nothing, looking at the TV without any emotions. I had the sensation that I was literally in my head seeing all of this nonsense and telling myself that huffing Duster ain't right. Maybe five minutes went by and we were listening to music, Phoenix flexing to be exact. Both did a huge balloon and enjoyed the songs. My homie who was here with us told me he saw the rapper in 3D, more like cinema 3D, when you see something that just sticks out of the screen. He huffed the fuck out of the can and nodded out again, looking twice as fucked up as he was a few minutes ago. When he finally came back to reality, he told me he was nodding out back and forth. He told me every time he nodded back, he was talking to himself, sitting on the floor, and he told himself that he was high as fuck. I was watching him the whole time and he wasn't moving for shit, just passed out. I have no fucking clue what happened in his head at that point. Don't be like my homie, please. I have used drugs recreationally since I was 16 years old, even used the needle for a few years on and off back in the 70s. My daily narcotic habits started back in 1990 when I had my first back surgery. I started out in Lortab, Tylox, and Percodan, and then graduated to morphine tablets, Oxycontin, and the fentanyl patch when my resistance to the others became apparent. I used Oxycontin 20 milligrams three times a day for about a year before I ended up breaking or crushing them and taking my prescribed dose too soon, only to stay in a state of slight withdrawal until I can get more. I ended up being placed on 80 milligram methadone tablets by my doctor, taking two 20 milligram tablets twice a day. This worked great at first for my pain and I did not have any bad side effects at the time. I took this high dose for over a year before my doctor had a major heart attack. My prescription was due to be refilled at the time and I could not find anyone to give it to me. Trying to stop an 80 mg a day methadone addiction at home was the worst thing I have ever experienced in my life. After three days, my withdrawal became massive. My blood pressure went sky high, my ankles felt like they were busting apart. I am not sure if it was from the high blood pressure or what. Every part of my body was in severe pain. I felt like I was coming out of my own skin, and even a sheet was painful to the touch. I could not even drink water, only suck on crushed ice. I could not sleep, eat, get comfortable, or function at all for almost two solid weeks. I literally prayed for death. After two weeks, I was finally able to be carried to a chair in my living room wrapped in a blanket, but I barely remember it. I do remember watching Braveheart three times in a row one time and never really saw or heard any of it. I was able to walk outside and sit on the grass after almost three weeks. The bad part was someone told me about a methadone clinic new in town and I begged them to take me as I felt like I was slowly going to die if something didn't happen soon. I had lost over 20 pounds in three weeks and I looked like death warmed over. The clinic started me on a dose of 30 milligrams right from the start and within two hours I was feeling so much better that it was unbelievable. The way it works at the clinic is that you can increase your dose every three days by 5 or 10 milligrams until you reach 100 milligrams. If you need more than that you see the doctor, have some blood work and get the increase. I of course went to 100 milligrams as soon as I could. Unlike the tablets I had taken, the liquid methadone has affected me differently. The first year I was at the clinic was a great one as I felt normal, but over time things about me started to change. I have turned into a recluse, not even wanting to talk on the phone. I feel like I am in a stupor all day, just existing. 
The worst part is that I have no sex drive at all, and I have gained over 60 pounds since I started there. I have no motivation, and I sit or lay like a slug all day. I sweat a lot too, I can't sleep over 3 hours a night, and my vision is screwed up. I am so afraid of the withdrawal that I have been going to this clinic for over 4 years straight now. Two years ago, I started decreasing my methadone by 5 milligrams every month or so. I finally made it to 5 milligrams 6 weeks ago, and I am now at 2 milligrams, which started 2 weeks ago. Let me tell you that the decrease from 5 milligrams to 2 milligrams has been horrible. To think that this stuff is that strong is mind boggling. I sweat horribly at times. I feel like I have a bad flu, which includes diarrhea most of the day. My ankles hurt and I have now developed heart palpitations that I now take medication for. The feeling of jumping out of my skin is an everyday occurrence, just not as severe as the first time. I am irritable, moody, depressed, and I feel like someone who has a terminal cancer or something. I feel so tired that walking across the floor exhausts me. I am picking my weekly takeout in the morning and I've decided this will be my last week. I dread what it will be like, but now that I have made it to 2 milligrams, I have to see this through. The first withdrawal was not by choice, this one is. I am praying that will make a difference. Hopefully others will read this and stay away from this horrible drug, and for those who are maintaining, hopefully they will see that if you decrease your dose very slowly, there is at least hope of becoming free of it. I've been using RCs and drugs in general for about 3 years now, and I've just hit 20. Exclusively stuck to psychedelics up until a few months ago, when I got extremely curious about the stimulant experience. It sounded like exactly what I needed based on my drug preferences in everyday life, so without hesitation, I placed my first order around last December. It was a sample package which contained around 7 of the most popular RC stimulants from my vendor website, killer price and around 2 grams of each substance along with a couple 2 and 3 FEA pills. Needless to say I waited for the mailman that Christmas like a toddler expecting their gift, and my dopamine hit its peak when I woke up one day after a couple of weeks of placing the order to see that its status was out for delivery. I happily grabbed the package from the mailman's hand, and the next two weeks are a blur. I only remember that I probably slept not even half of those 14 days. I was having an insane amount of fun by either being stimmed up on casual hangouts, gaming myself into oblivion which felt like I was a kid experiencing video games for the first time again, had the most intense sex of my life after barely being able to get it up due to vasoconstriction, and in general was having a blast. I remember 4 FMA being my favorite amongst all of them, along with honorable mentions 3 FPM and 3 CMC. It's really not as neurotoxic as they say, for any fellow researcher who's interested. Eventually those stimulants ran out, way faster than I had anticipated. I blamed it on the fact that I sold a few back then, but looking back it would have made very little difference to their longevity if I hadn't. Which brings us to 3 months back. I got my usual package of mixed stims and went absolutely ham on it as per usual. However, my one rule had been to not pull binges, as in when I hit the 24 hour mark no matter what time it was, I wouldn't redose. I would eat, hit a blunt, and then sleep whenever that came. Due to work stress and a bunch of errands I had to run, I figured, hey, why not? I feel like the ultimatrix of all version of myself on stims, so why not pull a 3 day bender on 3FMA, weed, overwatch, working out and do every errand or see all the people I wanted to eventually. The decision was already made in my mind during the first day. I wouldn't stop redosing until I hit 3-4 to four days to get a good trial of the stim psychosis experience. Food became a distant memory. Before I knew it, lost in a mild psychosis mindset on day 2, I checked my weight because my hip bones were popping out more than usual. I realized, oh shit, I really haven't eaten a thing since 36 hours ago at least. I lost 7 kilos due to how much I sweat and overexerted myself in a couple of days. 
Scary, but I think to myself, hey, I constantly eat. I'll regain that in a flash, so no biggie. On to the next day. Thankfully, during stimulant use, I always make sure to drink a shit ton of water as dehydration wasn't a real concern according to the countless empty two-liter bottles in my room. Worst part is, I felt disgusting. I showered five times in total, but the stench wouldn't wear off. And considering I live in a very hot country and that it was mid-July, you can guess how well that went for me. I had to keep a towel next to me whenever possible due to simply how much I was fucking sweating. I just hit master due to the insane aimbot and reflexes the substance gave me after having gotten so much done those few days. Whole house was clean, I hung out practically all day when I wasn't at work, and played Overwatch while listening to music all night while also doing any chore that would come to mind. The energy was insane. But all that comes with a cost. Third day, I start feeling my extremities and left arm go numb. I did the one thing you should never do in those situations. I googled it. Results basically assured me that I had a heart attack incoming and there was pretty much nothing I could do about it. I got kinda nervous but I thought I'll be fine, no redoses, period. It got worse. I felt a burning sting in my heart and had trouble breathing. I started to panic a bit so I started heading downstairs to grab some more water and then lay down. On the way there, my legs suddenly just go numb and stop working. I fall slowly on the ground, having difficulty breathing and turn white. My whole body was drenched in sweat, and instead of normal vision, I started having DMT-level visuals, which I'd only witnessed before on 5-MeO-DMT. Now, I remember that DMT gets released in the human body when you die, so that kind of terrified me in the moment. I thought, that's it. I'm gonna die. I felt my life slowly being pulled out of me as if I decided to stop fighting to stay awake. That would be it. After having turned into a skeleton and trying to regain strength in my body for 30 minutes, I decided to try and get up. Well, what do you know? I'm completely fine. Just need some really good food and rest. As far as I know, I got off with no damage that day. That's what the blood and heart test said anyways. Needless to say, that was a wake-up call for me. No more stimulant abuse. With the thoughts that ran through my head during those 30 minutes on the ground of me just trying to maintain stable breathing, I can say I'm glad to be alive. When I told the doctors about my experience, they said it was most likely a circulatory collapse or a panic attack. To be honest, I have no idea, but it was one of those hard life lessons that you need to learn.